Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage here in Atlanta for Supercomputing 24. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host. Check out our podcast. We, we co-host the podcast called theCUBE Podcast every Friday, check it out. Hassan is back in theCUBE. CUBE alumni is the head of software products ecosystem at Broadcom, here to unpack the AI factory, the networking role in it, and all the important kind of considerations to look at when you think about re thinking and re-architecting your, your infrastructure to support generative AI. The workloads are in demand. People are busy laying down the lines on what's going to be the future for the future runtime of large-scale systems. Sasan, great to see you. Dave, Thank looking you forward to this. Thank you, John. All right, so we had Dell on earlier. We kind of talked about the AI factory, but there's so much going on. Broadcom has really been leading in the area of enabling this kind of next-gen system. I call it clustered systems. I wrote a post on SiliconANGLE called we are now in the era of clustered systems. And, and the thesis was the server connected on a rack, the old days, is now a system of servers, a system of networking, a system of components, and you know, all kinds of componentry that chips that you guys make, NICs, smart NICs, Ethernet, all working in concert together. And it's large scale supercomputing capabilities, basically democratizing supercomputing for the masses, which is essentially what servers did in the old client server days and then became the internet. So this is a key area and people are making choices, Hassan. So let's start with what your vision is for how the clustered systems and the role of networking fits in because this is an important part. It may not be the big number where the cost is, but there are consequences if you don't get networking right in the AI paradigm. Yeah, Well, John, great question. So I completely agree with um, this question around cluster system. And, you know, if I go back, right, you know, we work with a lot of the hyperscalers to build the clouds that are out there, networking for that. And when we were doing this, we, we heard a lot of things around, hey, networking is getting in my way. How do I optimize the server utilization in that space? But go back three years ago when they were, everybody was starting to approach these large language models and they were trying to build these clusters, they came back with the same question that networking is getting in my way. And this is because AI is a fundamentally different workload and this is a fundamentally different problem compared to cloud computing, right? Um, as we, let's just look at, look at training for example, right? If you are training a large model and these models are growing at an exponential rate, yeah. they don't fit in a CPU and a core of a CPU, yeah. right? Virtualization is no play. They will not fit into tens of thousands of cores of a GPU, right? Uh, hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of GPUs are required to do that. This is why you cannot fit a model within a server or two servers or four servers and that is why you need a cluster. And guess what, right? When you have a cluster and everything is spread out, you need glue to <laughs> put this all together. Yeah. And that is networking. Yeah. And if you don't have robust networking to put all of this together, things are going to fall apart, right? You know, you may have spent a lot in this very large infrastructure, but you would not be able to utilize it. Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone focuses on the costs, and they are expensive. A rack could be very expensive. You can have a four million dollar rack, Dave. I forget the numbers you sized up, but they're 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 not small. Because, but the payout is great if you get the at workloads running right, because it's a game changer. But it's an extinction event in IT or failure, critical failure of networking fails because latency matters, connectivity matters and just tapping into the resource. I mean, it is the glue. I mean, this is a critical infrastructure component of the clusters. It, it's a make or break architecture. I mean, I want to amplify that because a lot of things gets overlooked a lot in the larger scope, but certainly if you're designing it, you know it. So I want to unpack, where is the innovation coming from? I know you guys are working hard on that Broadcom, but how does that trans, where's the innovation from on Broadcom side and where does that translate into the practitioner who's building it, because you got architecture that has to handle choice, whether it's workload choice, routing models, making sure that I'm tapping into the right machine that has the liquid cooling, one that has air cooling, there's like all kinds of system component decisions that's, it's like a run, it's like an operating system. I gotta, I gotta know what to do. I gotta, yeah. No, that's, so you gotta innovate at all levels of the stack, right? You know. We build up network silicon, we got to do a lot of innovation there. There's innovation in the system level, there's innovation that needs to happen on the software side. But let's unpack to your words, right? Let's just go back. Um, I mean, Meta talked about this a few years ago that look, 
uh, when I am building these clusters, I'm running these recommendation models, right? You know, if you're running browsing Facebook, right, you know, you're getting recommendations for ads, that's where they use the recommendation models. Up to 57% of the time was being spent in networking, right? It's a very expensive uh, investment that they've made and they want to utilize it to the fullest. Now, why does this happen, right? You really need to understand how machine learning works, right, at a very high level in order to do that. I mean, in machine learning, you're doing a lot of computation, you're doing a lot of matrix multiplication, then you spit out a lot of gradients and weights, right, which the GPUs exchange with each other. And what happens after that's done, you synchronize and then you start the cycle again, you keep till you get the error levels that you're looking for. Now, in this process, first of all, this is hugely bandwidth intensive process. Servers, to your point, yeah, they've been like 25, 50 if you're pushing to the servers. Up till now, that has worked very well. But over here, we're talking about 400 gig, moving to 800 gig, and in a couple of years, 1.6 terabit, right, ports. So, extremely high bandwidth. The second thing is, the flows in this case are what we call elephant flows. You don't have a lot of flows. <laughs> elephant are, flows? Elephant yeah, flows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> elephant workloads. And they are, the elephant in the room is... <laughs> they are big flows. So think of this as you're going on a highway, right? Yes. You know, and you have seven lanes. If you're not utilizing those seven lanes, you're going to have congestion. Yeah. And in, in, in the traditional cloud world with TCP IP, there are hundreds of thousand flows. They load balance very effectively, but you have to have very meticulous engineering to make sure that is done right. Then when these GPUs converse with each other, right, you know, a GPU could be communicating with six other at the same time, right? When the, and then you can, this is what we call in-cast. You're overwhelming a GPU, right? And how do you deal with this in-cast kind of a problem? Now, these training jobs will, will run for days. If you're running for days, I think what you'll find is one of the biggest failures when, we, when they're uh, uh, building this network besides the GPU is optics. Optics fail. If you yeah. assume a 2% uh, failure rate, that's about 15 failures per month in a 4,000 node cluster. Now, guess what? If you don't recover from that failure very well, you're going to go back yeah. right, to a checkpoint and say, start the process. Look what you've done to your training job. Yeah. So these are the essential things that need to be solved right, yeah. from a, a networking perspective. Right, how do you give the highest density? How do you give the highest performance? And then how do you load balance right? How do you do congestion control? How do you recover from failures? And that is something that we have incorporated, right, you know, in our silicon, in our roadmap. Yeah. Um, specifically, right, you know, speeds and feeds are extremely important. Yeah. And, you know, we have been on this cadence of doubling the density of performance every two years. Uh, we have done this like clockwork over the last decade. You know, we have a 51.2 terabit Tomahawk 5 right now, you could predict when the 100 terabit is coming. Um, and that will keep happening. Same thing, we have a huge investment in terms yeah. of building out AI specific NICs. We have a 400 gig NIC. You can predict a roadmap to 801.8. So just so, hold on, one, one quick yeah. on this one, one quick follow up and then I'll pass it to Dave. So you're saying with that training, the job completion is critical. That's the, uh, that's the end game, right? And the, if that's not happening, that's going to come from the bottleneck of the network, right? Because job completion, whether you're training or that, whatever the workload is, the bottleneck in the old days was, you know, jitter, you know, latency. That's what you're getting at, right? Is that is that what you're saying? You 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 hit the nail on the head. That is the most critical metric that everybody should be looking at: job completion time, right? You know, you talk about latency. Latency in the case of AI workloads is not latency through a switch. is not that important. It is. When do you receive the last message, yeah. right? Because that's what we call tail latency, right? So you want to minimize the tail latency, which will minimize the job completion time, and that can only happen if you have the best load balancing, the best congestion yeah. control, and best failover. And, and that's where the negatives. GPUs are excelling. They're actually making the job, the new jobs, which is a new, net new category, happen faster. So it's not happening, it's not worth it. I mean, that's basically Absolutely. a critical fail. That's, yeah. the, that's the connection point. Hey, let me in. Uh, hey, come, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys saw this in the Wall Street Journal today. It isn't just data centers. AI's plumbing needs an upgrade. I thought they were going to talk about liquid cooling, but they, it, was, it was an article about networking. Now, they're not wrong, because they talk about bandwidth, yeah. but they were talking about Cisco. I mean, this is not a, a, an old school router and switching problem. What you just described, Hassan, is sort of a new thinking, new era, new bottleneck around networking. So. I'm really interested in helping the audience understand the connections sort of within 
the XPUs, as you sort of mentioned, this, you, you talked about you know some of the the, the parameters, the, the the weights. So you have compute going through the roof. You have data like this. Yep. And you have the the weights and the parameters, all three kind of scaling together. So the XPUs are talking to each other, and then, as you described, tens of thousands, half a million, maybe even someday, may, not maybe a million. Yeah. GPU clusters, all right? So different types of networks that you guys are, are driving that are going to become the dominant, yeah, we're still going to have switches and routers and those sort of old school internet, you know, John, that you know so well, but this is a completely new refresh of the existing infrastructure. And I wonder if you could explain sort of those dynamics. No, um, and by the way, good by the way, the article didn't even mention Broadcom, which is at the heart of this. Obviously, yeah. Nvidia yeah. is there as it's well. Wall Street yeah. Journal. I mean, that's yeah, like, yeah, it's not really. I mean, it's media. But, but it was yeah, a great. It's but media. but the, but their timing was good, right? Yeah. I mean, they're right. Yeah. They're not wrong, but they don't go deep enough. So I'd love you to do that. No, absolutely. So if you when when you're building the AI infrastructure, right? You know, we think of it in two ways. We call a scale up network and a scale out network. Okay. Now the scale up network is where. To your point, the XPUs are connected together, right? There is this desire to have that domain as big as possible. This domain is probably like 64 GPUs today, it will probably move to 128, 256 moving forward, right? The requirements for this domain are slightly different compared to scale up. Scale up is like you have this scale up domain, right? That's, let's say it's 64 GPUs, but you have 10, thousand of these domains or and you need to connect all of them together that is the scale out network so we do both right so and the scale out is something that you know we have talked a lot you know I've described a lot that I've uh, described the requirements around is like you know this is kind of Ethernet is now becoming kind of the de facto standard for the scale out network there are the largest clusters out there hundred thousand GPUs which are based on this Meta, right, at OCP announced, like, using, leveraging some of our technology that they have built very large clusters. You know, InfiniBan was an option at this point of time. It may still remain for, in some cases, but dominantly the world is moving there. We also believe for the scale-up, which is where you're connecting the XPUs together, Ethernet is the right technology. The requirements there are slightly different uh, because over there, latency becomes a more important factor, right? You know, you need to be able to cater to very small packets at very high throughput. You need to have what we call link level refries. You need to be able to optimize the headers to utilize the bandwidth Cause you're, effectively. Because you're managing asynchronous distances, correct, right? Yeah. Correct, okay. So, but we believe Ethernet has the capability to solve that as well. Now, NVIDIA has a technology called NVLink, right, with which we do this. But we believe that uh, just like standards and open have prevailed for scale outs, right? That is what everybody is looking for scale up as well. They don't want to be tied down. Ethernet has the capability to get this done and uh, that will prevail. So what changed? I mean, four or five years ago, it was like, oh, InfiniBand, that's going to be the dominant, you know, high performance, high bandwidth, Ethernet, you know, it's got its place. But now you're talking about Ethernet being becoming a dominant, the dominant um, uh, protocol. What changed? I think um, InfiniBand was being used for a certain size clusters in HPC environments, right? It worked very well in those proprietary domains. What has happened is, it is this whole, this wave around AI and LLMs, like especially with hyperscalers, right? When they, when you have to go to GPT-4 with 1.3 trillion parameters and you've got to train this extremely large clusters. And to your point, this is today, right? We're talking about 30 to 64,000 GPU, maybe 100,000 GPU clusters today. But this, a million is not far away, mm -hmm. right? When you are trying to do this, a technology like InfiniBand just cannot scale, right? It does not have those failover mechanisms. And plus, there is uh, no ecosystem, right? Ethernet, the thing about it is standards-based, it's a large ecosystem. Um, you know, there is people who know how to manage Ethernet-based networks. There are troubleshooting tools, yeah. monitoring tools that are available. People are like, I don't want islands, technology islands, right? I, uh, whenever you're building an AI network, you have a front-end, a back-end, a storage, 
and an out-of-band management network. That's all Ethernet. So it's a standard way of managing all it's of It's funny, the article, Dave, says NVIDIA makes a platform called, uh, makes networking platform called InfiniBand for moving large amounts of data. And then it goes in, um, it says Ethernet, comma, a competing platform considered less mature for AI networking, comma. They do that in the, in the mainstream media. They have to explain with the comma. Uh, but they say it's less mature, okay? For networking, actually, it's been around for longer. And TCP/IP. I love how they do that. Ethernet, <laughs> come on. Yeah. For people who don't know what it is, and they got it wrong. So, uh, InfiniBand isn't more mature than Ethernet. Number one, it's good for one use case, moving between small nodes. Yeah. Okay, that's it. I mean, that's pretty much it. it yeah, other things, but that's pretty much it. Ethernet is everywhere. It's connected to other even systems. Even for the that's AI, awesome. the largest clusters are all based on Ethernet, right? So, yeah. I, I mean, I think... Uh, this is not debatable. Even yeah. NVIDIA is, is doing Ethernet. I mean, it's not like the, the market's Absolutely. not Absolutely. They are, that and actually, we're all for it, right? We want... Uh, yeah, why not? NVIDIA is doubling down on their Ethernet roadmap, and that's the beauty of Ethernet, right? You have other players out there, yeah. and what it gives customers the choice, it brings the cost down, it keeps the costs in check, and what we say is, may the best execution win. Right? In the, in the, in the uh, evolution and innovation on the chip side, you know, Ethernet also has an advantage. I saw Broadcom present Ethernet in the actual fabric of the board. Ethernet can be embedded into the system in ways that are more effective in the cluster. I think you guys are building chips in this area where Ethernet's kind of in substrate. Or you, so take us through why Ethernet is good for Broadcom, but then on the open ecosystem side, how does that extend out to the value? I mean, is it less expensive to deploy, is it better energy? Take us through where the Ethernet fits into the, as the chips get better, yeah. you know, there's limited space. Yeah. They come in here. So, I mean, Ethernet is, um, first of all, it is ahead of any other technology by a generation, right? I talked about this 51.2 terabyte chip. Um, it's at least a generation ahead, and it's, this, this has been in production since March of 2023. So when you are a generation ahead in terms of performance and density, you can replace six systems with one system, right? So think of like you have you you had a previous generation six boxes. You can replace this with one single box. That's about a seventy-five percent percent reduction in power. Imagine what you're saving on space, on cooling, and plus, these are very simple systems. You need don't need large chassis to do this. You can pack so much. I mean, Tomahawk 5, you can build uh, 64 ports of 800 gig, 128 ports for 400 gig, and two yeah. are you. And the right. AI so fabric you guys have, Jericho. Exactly. So we have uh, Jericho, which is basically a DDC fabric, and you know, that's a, you can build a 32,000 node cluster, right, with just pizza boxes, very small pizza boxes. So it's, it's simple, uh, saves you on power, saves you on cost, and plus, like I talked about, you know, there's a huge ecosystem, right? The ecosystem knows how to manage this yeah. thing, how to troubleshoot this thing, yeah. and and the cost, right? You know, at the end of the day, it's the cost of Ethernet is absolutely lower than any other technology, <laughs> and when you are, have many other players doing this, it's gonna make yeah. sure that, you know. Ecosystem. Uh, you uh, it, it's cost effective. Hassan, great to have you on. Final point before we close, I know we've run a little bit over time. Um, I want you to touch on the, e the ecosystem with the consortium, Ultra Ethernet. Yeah. This is now more proof points. Give a quick plug for what's going on there. I know you're involved with in a collection of open vendors in there and why that's important. Yeah, Ultra Ethernet consortium, like we talk, discussed, right? there are clusters with 16,000, 32,000 nodes out there. But as we look forward, right, you know, there is already talk about, you know, Microsoft has talked about a huge investment. You will see clusters, half a million, um, a million nodes. And when you have these, there are all sorts of challenges come to the table, right? And you know, when we talk to a lot of people, we're like, hey, there are a lot of miracles that need to happen, you focus on your own miracle. You know, imagine these are not gonna fit in one data center, they are gonna go across multiple data centers which are tens of or hundreds of kilometers apart, how do you make it all work? How do you manage failover, power, cooling, how do you do connect, how do you manage latency? But one important component is, you know, fundamental to uh, any work, um, uh, AI workloads is RDMA, right? RDMA is the protocol, and when you run it over uh, Ethernet, it's Rocky, right? Yep. Uh, which is uh, RDMA over converged Ethernet. 
Now, this is two decades old. Right? So this <laughs> mature, is mature, as he said. <laughs> That's mature. It's been around you for know, a while. So it's got multi-pathing, selective transformations. It's got all kinds of out-of-order packet exactly, technologies. Right. So, so the RDMA was, yes, it was useful in Finland, but if you want to you go to this bigger scale, you need to be able to fix it. You need to bring multi-pathing to your point, out-of-order placement, yep. selective retransmit. Yep. And these are the kind of capabilities that are being discussed. Now, there are yeah. more than 100 members in UEC, yeah. right? So, the, so let's talk about the ecosystem. So, and even NVIDIA is now part of the UEC, which is awesome. So I, I think that's what uh, is happening. People are standardizing on these kind of implementations. So people have a standard implementation which can allow them to scale down the road to no matter what size clusters they've got. More proof, open source wins, open ethernet is winning. It will be the fabric, Hassan. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. And of course, we're going to do more in our AI research, our AI labs we're building. So stay tuned for more CUBE. After this short break, I'm John with Dave Vellante with Savannah Pugin and Kristen Nicole here on the ground at Supercomputing 2024. We'll be right back. Easy.